Um, so the, the higher attic class I thought was really fun. What I, the, I know I have higher attic students here. Did everyone have fun? Yeah. Yes. I yes. thought it was great. Um, I that thought it went fun. surprisingly well, actually. I, I said at the beginning, you know, we're going to kind of figure out how this works to like teach a higher attic class online because I've never seen that done before. Um, I was pleasantly surprised by how easy it was, honestly. It's a little tricky with the, you know, laptop screen and getting everything visible, but um, I thought it worked really well. So yeah, if you're interested, come to the higher attic class, email me about it, um, join that, super fun. And now, uh, without any further introduction, we'll go back to hieroglyphic. So as you'll recall from two weeks ago before I uh, had a week break, uh, we were looking at uniliterals and I thought we had finished on this page because I saw the blank space and thought that was the end of it. Uh, it wasn't, there's an, actually an, a few more on the next page. So I just put in the answers, uh, high, uh, I did the text color in red just to highlight that I had gone and put those in after the fact. I thought I'd just run through them really quick. Uh, so this, this word, desher, that means red. So Egyptological pronunciation is desher. Uh, Torish is the Coptic equivalent. Uh, Desheret is the red land or the desert. And you can see how that works. So you have desher meaning red. Desheret is the red feminine thing. Um, and often, uh, you can use feminine adjectives to describe places. So if you say desheret, that means the red place, uh, namely the, the place where the ground is red or reddish orange and um, the desert um, or the, the escarpments on Niles, either side of the Nile Valley. What else was I gonna say about this? Oh, uh, desheret is not etymologically related to the English word desert, despite what some people may say. This is one of those common things that people love to say for some reason, that the Egyptian word desheret is the source of the word desert. Uh, it's not, uh, desert comes from desero, to, to abandon in Latin. It's the uh, passive participle, yeah. Uh, debet or tobe. This interestingly is where we get the English word adobe. So it goes from ancient Egyptian into Arabic, with the Arab conquest, across North Africa, um, into Spain with the Moors. It's borrowed into Spanish after the Reconquista. It's taken by conquistadors to um, the American Southwest where it gets used to describe mud brick buildings there also. And then um, it gets adapted as a English word, Adobe, and also the name of the or software company in the universe. So there you go. That's the history of that. Um, feature creep. Adobe's feature creep problem is the is like it is a textbook example of why you should avoid feature creep. Anyway, uh, enough about my my complaints. Uh, Dene is wing. Me Dan too. <laughs> You complain about Adobe. Everyone complains about Adobe, especially with the the like. Now it's a monthly payment to just use the software. You have to pay them monthly to so use. Why can't I just buy the software? Ridiculous. You're not making something every month. You're not making something new every month. You're just renting me something. It's like those stores where you like rent furniture, <laughs> and, which is like so. I mean, those stores are overtly exploitative of poor people. I know Adobe is like, well, we'll just take that model of exploiting people and we'll just do it to everyone. Um, I guess there's certain honor in that. They're not just exploiting poor people. They, they are at least <laughs> equal, equal opportunity in, in the way that they exploit their customers. But yeah, I could complain all That's day true. about Adobe. I've, I've written quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I've written many rants about Adobe Z, I don't know this Adobe Z, but yeah, I'll, I'll check it out later. Okay, um, Den is wing, Dene in the Egyptological pronunciation. Uh, Janet is the city of Tanis, and you can actually see that the Greek name of the place Tanis comes from the Egyptian name, uh, Jatne. So yeah, that one's pretty straightforward. Another example of wing, uh, this time Jene, and with this, I wanted to show that there's a um, 
what's it called? A, a diachronic uh, transformation that's being realized in the late Egyptian orthography. So uh, the older version of the word is jene. A lot of these uh, second Ds or, or palatal Ds uh, got moved forward and became alveolar Ds. So you'll actually see both writings in late Egyptian as that, that transformation is still ongoing. Or, or the transformation has already completely happened phonetically, but there's a historical spelling. Sometimes they write it the historical way. Sometimes they write it the, uh, the way that matches the current pronunciation. Uh, we have plenty of similar things in English. Uh, for example, let's see. Oops, I didn't have my pen ready. Uh, we have things like through, which is obviously no longer pronounced through, or, or however it was, through, with, with that. And then you'll see, like at like drive throughs at fast food restaurants, they write it through. Uh, you get the same sort of thing here. This is a more modern spelling, and this is the more historical spelling. I have a few examples like that in here. I just uh, put pairs of things so that you can compare them. Uh, Jehti, oh, I mistyped this one. Oops, let's get transliteration keyboard. Jehti or Daht is lead. Not sure why I specifically chose that one. I think, it, I think it's a neat word, uh, but we have another case where there's a more modern spelling and a more historical spelling, one with the second T. Uh, wait, how did these, did these end up out of order? How did this end up here? Hmm, I'm not sure. They seem not to be in proper alphabetical order. I must have made a mistake there. Okay, yeah, that, the, the previous one is in the wrong place. I'll fix that later. Um, and then Jed, which is a really common word in Egyptian. It's, it's definitely one of the like 100 most common words. Uh, Egyptological pronunciation, Jed, Coptic Jo. And then uh, Jedah to arrest. Uh, I don't know the Coptic reflex of that, but it appears in the story, so it's in the vocabulary. Okay, so that's all the uniliterals. Uh, sorry, I left those out last time. Thought we'd just go over them real quickly to get started. Now we're going to start talking about biliterals. And this is where it kind of gets interesting because um, with the uniliterals, you could very easily imagine that. You can write Egyptian just like any other alphabetic script um, or any abjad because it doesn't have the vowels. And that's not the case. One of the reasons there are so many hieroglyphs and things look so, um, you know, um, like chaotic and interesting is because there are lots of different ways to write the same sequence of consonants. So you can have uniliteral signs, which can be used to spell words. Uh, all of these are examples from the story or from the dictionary that are spelt entirely with just uniliterals plus a single classifier. Um, but most Egyptian words are not spelt only with uniliterals. There's normally um, biliterals or then multiliterals. So we're just jumping into multiliterals to get started with biliterals. So these are sequences of two signs. And I'm, I'm sure you all read the chapter here. Essentially, the way it works is you can imagine just writing the word cat either with uniliterals and then a classifier or with just a picture of a cat. Um, you know, if, the, if you're inventing a script totally from scratch and you want to just uh, communicate the idea of cat, you draw a little picture of a cat. But very quickly, that written sign will um, attach itself to the phonetic value of that word. And this is something that we see all throughout the history of writing. I think there is no, as far as I know, there's no widely used script that is totally non-phonetic. And, uh, you know, there, there are varying degrees, but really every writing system acquires some phonetic quality just because there's this constant correlation of the way the word is spoken and the way it's written. And it's, it's difficult to avoid. What we see in Egyptian is that um, signs that were used to represent things very quickly acquire the, the consonants in that word. And just to use an English example, uh, if we use this word, this 
emoji to write the word cat. Uh, it will attach to that phonetic realization. And then theoretically, we could use it someplace else. We could write caterpillar, um, you know, spelling out the word phonetically and then adding a classifier at the end. Those are my emoji hieroglyphs. And then we could even, uh, in a case where we're just writing the consonants, we could take it even further. So we could write, uh, we could write the word cut as K T plus the scissors, or we could actually just borrow the the cat glyph that we already have that already represents that phonetic sequence, and then just add a classifier uh, that tells us it it belongs to a different category of things, but it has those same consonantal values. And this is the way a lot of Egyptian words are written. Um, that's why. It took so long to decipher Egyptian because a lot of words contain objects that really have nothing to do with what the word is spelling. It's just a phonetic coincidence. We've talked about that before, but it's good to remember. Uh, so when you see a lot of, you know, birds and animals and people, those aren't necessarily the, uh, the things being described. They've just acquired these phonetic values. And I think most hieroglyphs are phonetic. Yeah, for pretty easily most, by far most in any given text are phonetic. Uh, so they don't have any connection to the thing they represent except a coincidental phonetic connection. Um, we refer to them generally as multiliterals. So we're going to look at uh, triliterals and quadriliterals and clinical literals and uh, they're, they're even more, I don't know, sexiliterals, it's a weird sounding word. Um, yeah. Oh, I talked about it here. Yeah. For the rest, we use highly technical terms like a bunch. And Multiliteral. Distinct. What's that? Uh, Multiliteral, it's the best best, uh, best way to say it after tr uh, triliteral. Yeah, just say multiliteral. That's totally fine. Uh, technically, they're all multiliterals. So um, Really, biliterals on are multiliterals. Um, even even uniliterals could theoretically be classed as um, like a subclass of multiliterals, but they're just the case where the number of sounds represented is one. It's a little more complicated than that, actually. Um, so, biliteral chart. Uh, I unapologetically stole this idea from Alan's textbook. You've probably seen it there if you've looked at his Middle Egyptian. It's just a matrix of uh, first and second values. And it's, it's, I think, pretty straightforward to use. I've had some confusion in the past, though, so I'll just explain it quickly. Uh, this is the, the row is the first consonantal value in the biliteral, and the column is the second value. So if you are looking for the value of this sign, um, it's W plus Ein, so Wa, uh, same thing here, W plus P, so Wep, let's pick a weirder example, um, Q plus, if you scroll a little bit, plus S is S, and then, yeah, oops, uh, second D plus D is Jed. So that's how that works, uh, rows and columns. It's pretty straightforward. You should use this in when working on the vocabulary um, to look things up. Because by going through this exercise of having the biliteral chart and looking up the ones you don't know, that's really the fastest way to memorize them. Um, I, this is not the full set of biliterals that exist. Uh, there's, there are probably, I would say, at least double this many. but this is the set that appears in the story that we're going to read. And you really don't need to know, you don't need to sit down and learn all of the biliterals or all the multiliterals. Uh, in, once you have enough of them to kind of provide a foundation so you can start reading things, the others you'll pick up from seeing them in context and you know, looking at the hieroglyphs with the transliteration, you'll, you'll start to make those associations. Um, you, you'll infer the, the biliteral quality of the signs rather than having to look them up in a chart. So this is just kind of a getting started sampling of biliteral signs that you'll use. And then I, I put in a short section here on phonetic complements. Um, basically the way it works is that multiliterals are often also paired with uniliterals 
And when there is a multiliteral and a uniliteral, the, the consonant doesn't appear twice. It's, it's really just there once. Um, and there are a few examples here. Let me zoom in a little bit. So uh, this sign can be either a classifier for verbs of motion or it can be the biliteral eu. And then often it's written also with the uniliteral quail chick, which is also w, but it's not eu, -u, it's, it's just eu. They kind of collapse into one sequence. Um, similarly, the word eu can be written like this. Uh, what is the difference between these two words? Great question. I have no idea. Uh, nobody, nobody knows. Mm. Actually, it is a debatable topic. You, it's also uh, too different. The other one, as a, a temporal a construction or something like that, uh, as a particle. Oh, right. They have different meanings, but like uh, phonetically, what's the difference? Or like um, no. even more, like you know, kind of zooming out a little bit. Why have two ways of writing the same sequence of consonants? Why would a script need to do that? Aurelio, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I mean, Chinese does it all the time too. It works very similar where you have, for the majority of characters, 90% um, plus, one half is phonetic, the other one is the meaning indicator, basically. Mm -hmm. But phonetics, there could be more than one choice as well, because at some point in time, you took a character, you made it a phonetic in another character, uh, like Russian nesting dolls, you can, can build more and more complex ones. And I'm guessing it's the same thing here. So they wanted to write um, the phonetic one for the particle and the one for going. They just happen to have the same consonants. I mean, it's not, it's not really an issue. I don't think in either of those two scripts, people were going for like a one-to-one -one relationship based on abstract principles. But it's more oh, like, no, I want yeah. to write the word to go. Uh, let's, let's throw a, a W in there and two legs. And it just happens to be um, those two consonants. The, the, um, read leaf consonant of the W. So basically what I'm trying to say is, I think the, the approaching it with the mindset, what's the minimal number of elements that we need? It's the wrong way. If you approach it like right. that, it will look <clears throat> awfully confusing. It's historically grown. When right. you think about it, why do we spell time, T-H-Y-M-E or T-I-M-E? <laughs> it's kind of kind of a similar problem. Yeah, and it, I think the answer is quite similar too. Yeah. Like. Um, well, it, it could go a bunch of different ways. So in, in theory, these might have always been um, phonetically identical or you know, not meaningfully distinguished in, in the script. Um, or it could be a case like this, where I would assume that these two words were pronounced differently at some point and they've since merged. Uh, the example I always use that I really love is way, way, and way. Um, I mean, it's, it's really obvious that these were once pronounced differently. This would have been like the voiceless W, I guess, because it has the H, so Hui. Um, this one would have had a, like a velar fricative. So I guess it would have been, I don't know, Wei, something like that. And then, um, yeah, this one. It's the, the Y from the G uh, in Proto-Germanic. So, uh, and it's, it's really just a matter of like phonetic changes uh, have sort of coincidentally brought three different words to a point where they're now phonetically identical. Um, but there, there's a historical reason for the difference in spelling. There doesn't have to be though. Uh, what you were saying Aurelio, I think is, is very valid. Uh, if you wanna write the particle EU, it's like, well, it's, it's it has these two consonants, I can hear them. I'll just write, you know, e u. And then if you want to write the verb to come, uh, use the walking legs, because that's the normal way you've been writing that. And then it's like, oh, it's not the one that's e, it's the one that's e u that has the w sound in it. So I'll add a little w to that. And, um, you know, the, they could have had this exact same consonantal sequence since before hieroglyphic writing was even invented. And, the spellings of those two words were just created separately and the people who created them kind of followed a different path to development that resulted in a different spelling. Uh, I think the question is still important. Um, like why does Egyptian have so many ways of 
writing the same thing uh, if they are identical? I think it's a worthwhile question to ask, but not necess it doesn't necessarily have an interesting answer. Um, or it doesn't necessarily have an, an informative answer. The answer might simply be like an accident of history. Christian, one more. Actually, sure. just looking at the, the bottom there with basically the two marrows, um, or actually the three. The other thing is it's easier to read if you have multiple different ways to, to, um, uh, to spell it, quote unquote. Uh, those that, that speak Japanese on this, this call they, um, or read Japanese, they'll be familiar with that. I hate reading Japanese in Kana when everything is spelled out phonetically. It's just such a pain to do, um, especially since normally it's spelled without spaces. So you have to know where it ends essentially. And um, what I'm basically trying to say is if you have those different combinations, I think it makes it easier for the brain to pass the text, especially a text that doesn't have vowels, that doesn't have spaces. So you're relying on determinatives and different spellings to immediately gas, uh, grasp which word is meant. So that would be the other thing. I think one reason why they have so many variations is because it actually makes it easier to read once you're familiar with the system. Yeah, I mean, that's the argument in favor of English orthography as well. Is that, you know, having those three spellings of way means that they're, they're distinguished before you even finish reading the sentence. You can tell what thing is being referred to. Um, you don't have to do that sort of phonetic disambiguation while reading, which seems to be more difficult. We do phonetic disambiguation uh, while listening to speech uh, totally naturally, uh, but it seems to be more difficult when, um, when reading. So yeah, it, it could definitely serve that role. Um, now, nobody knows for sure what the answer is, like why Egyptian does this. Uh, it, it could be any of these things. I think it's worth remembering, uh, just as in the case with these, you know, way, way, and way, uh, where these were once different and have merged now. Uh, basically, the the view we have of Egyptian comes from very, very late. So it'd be like looking at it, at English only at the time that these three words are pronounced the same, and then just assuming that um, that these combinations of graphemes had always produced the same phonetic sequence for, for all of the history of English. Uh, that's kind of what we do with Egyptian because we really mm -hmm. only have points of comparison that are very, very late in the history of the language after there had been a lot of phonetic changes and after the hieroglyphic script, script was basically not being used for everyday activities anymore. Um, so if there is some sort of historic difference between these things, we can't see it. Uh, so it's, it's worth remembering just for that reason. Uh, if there is anything else to be discovered about the way the hieroglyphic scripts uh, represents the language, um, it's kind of wise to assume that there could be differences that our view of the evidence is obscuring. It's something worth thinking about, uh, something I've been interested in ever since I started studying the subject. So that's, I guess it's like, I don't know how long, 15 years now. Um, just because I don't, I don't have a really satisfying answer of why things work the way they do. Now, I guess I should add some of our explanations in here that we just uh, discovered by talking about it. Oops. I'm making this note for myself. Otherwise, I'll never remember where to find this. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think that'll be great to go put those in. We'll talk about the, the various. Oh, topics. look! I used it in the in the text, um, which I totally went back and reread before this class, like I was supposed to. Okay, so um, that's the overview of biliterals. I think they're they're not that confusing. It's really just taking the intellectual step of saying. I can have a single sign that can represent a sequence of consonants and now I have to deal with that. Um, and then phonetic complements, basically don't, don't write it twice. Uh, you probably will make the mistake of writing these twice. Sometimes every new student I've ever had does that a few times. So that's, you know, just part of learning. Um, yeah, let's just get started with it. So we have quite a lot of words here. 
Uh, does anyone want to volunteer? Let's do, I don't know. May I begin? <laughs> May I try? Uh, who, uh, who's speaking hey. right now? Can you say your name, please? Claudio. Oh, Claudio, there you are. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, I found here three I. Yeah. Pro and probably um, W at the end. I'm not sure. After her, after the lesson, I'm not so sure. Yeah. So uh, based on what I just told you, that's a little bit confusing because this can be a biliteral. It can also be a classifier, and this is often the case. And that's kind of what I was trying to show. Uh, not the exercise. Sorry. Let me go to the other thing. Uh, that's what I was trying to show with the cat example. Um, is that if you, you know, if you're spelling the word this way and you have the cat in there as a classifier, it's going to take on that phonetic quality and then it's going to be able to use it elsewhere. That's basically what happened with Egyptian. So you have this verb EU that means to come and it always has the walking legs classifier. And then those take on the, that phonetic value, but it could also still be a classifier in other words. It doesn't have to only be that. Um, Aurelio, did you have something? Yep, quick note. If it's at the, I think it's a fair rule. Of course, I'm sort of cheating because normally you don't have spaces between words, but if you know it's the last sign in the word, it's normally not a, not a bilateral. Um, normally at the end of the word, you'd have a, you'd have either monoconsonantals or you'd have a, um, you'd have a de determinative, I think. Mm. So just rule of thumb. Of course, in the text, you wouldn't know that it's the end of the word because there are no spaces, but yeah. I think that rule holds, right, Christian? Um, yeah, I think so too. They're, they're, I would guess that cases where biliteral signs end a word are quite rare. Uh, because you have, uh, not because you couldn't do it that way or there's anything preventing it, but just because you have multiple factors coming in that make it less likely. So you have the, the frequency of words using classifiers that eliminates all of those words from having a final biliteral, and you have the frequency of phonetic complements following biliterals, um, and that eliminates all of those words from having one. So then the ones that you have left, once you cut out all the cases where uh, the biliteral is not the last sign, ends up being quite few. That's a bit of a complicated explanation, uh, but yeah, I, I think that's probably true. I haven't run the numbers, but it's probably true. I very rarely see biliterals at the end of a word. So yeah, you don't need the ooh in this case because this is not the biliteral sign eu. This is the classifier for verbs of motion. Okay. May I go ahead? Sure. Um, the second one is just I and W. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one W, yes? Yes, Only one, one w. w. So it doesn't get repeated here. Um, it just gets... Um, like collapsed into that word. It happens a lot of times, or does it happen a lot of times? But the last vowel, the last consonant after after the biliteral sign. Um. Yeah. So it's it's very often the case that the thing following a biliteral sign will be a uniliteral sign serving as a phonetic complement. It's, um, that's a really consistent pattern in the way Egyptian is written. And you can see it here, you know, all over the, well, that's not a good example. Um, you know, most of the examples of biliterals we have, have a phonetic complement after them. So that's just very often the case. And, um, this uh, phonetical complement doesn't mean anything phonetically, but only uh, for written language. Right. Um, yeah, it's only written. Uh, we think. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we don't know for sure. Uh, if it does do something phonetically, we don't know what it does. Um, but it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to. So. 
Okay, uh, the third one, uh, I think I have a lot of letters, too much, mm -hmm. but I try. <laughs> uh, again, I, W, R, uh, T, um, Y, um, R, yep. or R, and D. Okay. Um, it's impossible to read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let's let's correct it first before we try to read it. So this you have R for these sequences of signs. I don't think that should be. This is not where this biliteral. This is WEP, and this uniliteral is P. Hmm. So I'm just going to change this right away. So this this is this right. Um, wow. The horns, the horns are wet. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. not our Uputi. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, and then this sign is actually a classifier. So it can be a biliteral red. Um, that means foot, essentially. But in this case, it's not. Um, it's a person who does a lot of traveling. So it's just a classifier that has to do with like they, they walk around a lot. Uh, so yeah, things that have to do with traveling or walking often have that classifier. So we can take off the red uh, that you got from this. Then we're just left with EU PETI, which is much more reasonable. And in fact, um, so there's a word weput, which means like uh, errand, mission, task, um, whatever. It's kind of this generic word, business. And then if you make Waputi, this is like the person who goes on a mission or the person who carries the message or carries out the task, whatever. Um, so that's a pretty straightforward derivation, but you can see from the Coptic that the word actually begins with just a, um, a, a poete. Uh, so there's no W at the beginning of this word What's probably happened is that the initial W changed to an initial yod or initial glottal stop in pronunciation. So they're actually writing this as a sort of correction for this. So the, the derived word is this, Waputi, then it's no longer pronounced like Waputi in late Egyptian. It's actually pronounced like Apote uh, with no W. So then to correct that, you put the sign that should be at the front and it's basically <laughs> like saying, don't use this, use this instead. We'll see a, quite a lot of that as we learn more of this. Erin, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, why does this word merit so many classifiers at the end? I mean, would, would walking legs not be sufficient to communicate that it's a, you know, a person who travels? Like, why is it the leg and then the two legs and then a guy? In theory, you could just have this actually. This would be the most is likely. It ever, is it ever written that way? Just like just oh, like that? Oh, probably. I don't know for sure, oh. um, but probably. I, pretty much any of these words can be written a, a dozen or so different ways. So that's sort of a down to the scribe kind of thing if he feels like throwing in a couple extra, okay. Yeah, and, um, and you know, in hieratic signs are cheap, right? You're just, especially something like- Sure. Um, I don't remember exactly how they look, but just doing something like this, like it's really easy to just add a bunch of classifiers for the sake of clarification. Okay. Um, so they tend to do that in hieratic texts. They tend to add more classifiers than they need. Uh, and really this, this word straddles to uh, like, like taxonomic branches. So it's a, it's a sort of person and it's also a sort of motion and it's the sort of thing that you do with your feet. And it's really all of those at the same time. It's the thing that's at the intersection of all those activities. So having all those classifiers is useful um, for just very quickly identifying what this thing is. But yeah, it's a bit overkill. But really, yeah. you know, what we've been seeing today with phonetic complements and, and everything else is that uh, Egyptian kind of likes to use overkill in writing. It tends to put more information than you than is strictly necessary. Uh, part of that is just, it's to provide, it's to provide a sort of um, like a self-healing code. 
So if you're reading hieratic as, as we just did in the previous hour, um, there are quite a few hieratic signs that could be identified multiple different ways. And, um, or they can be, they can get smudged together or they could be misread or whatever. So the more you put in there, the more uh, related context you add, the easier you make it for the reader to identify exactly what you intended. Uh -huh. so it's, it's kind of a scribal strategy for, for clarity. It's just, just put more stuff. Um, okay. It's analogous to uh, doing this with the number seven, really. Um, you know, this could be maybe confused with a one with a big dangly thing on it. Um, you know, when in doubt, just add more ink to the page. And yeah. that, will, that will serve a disambiguating function. So, so I have a question about the foot also, which is mm -hmm. that um, in your table, it's <clears throat> the, the, uh, the biliteral is, the transliteration is uh, RD. Mm -hmm. Um, however, I noticed that, and I, again, I apologize, the Wikipedia table for biliterals, which claims to source Allen, the mm. 2010 edition, shows RD for the leg, and in the Gardner sign list on EgyptianHieroglyphs.net, it says for Gardner D56, which is the leg, it says phonetic PD determinant for leg or foot example RD leg PD knee. So is yeah. it RD or PD or is it? Great question. Um, I have no idea. So okay. So, so my first question was actually: Should we never ever look at Wikipedia ever? <laughs> no, definitely. I you definitely should. There's a lot of good information on there. Um, a lot of a lot of reading Egyptian is kind of entertaining multiple possibilities at the same time. Uh, okay. that's, you know, that's definitely where you get to, because we don't know everything. And a lot of times things can be seemingly contradictory, but simultaneously true. Uh, so for example, um, rat means foot, leg, pot. I feel like pot is more like, uh, now I don't even know, I've confused myself. Uh, in Coptic, we have these two words, right? And I mean, normally I've seen it written this way, but, or, or maybe this way. Um, rat and pat. This one I think is more foot and this one's more leg. Okay. Um, mm, I'm really, I'm really not sure, honestly. So uh, even Coptic texts, will just kind of swap between them. Like they'll say one in one case where it's clearly foot and then they'll use that same word um, five sentences later where it's clearly leg. So that's a confusion that, that's an ambiguity that existed in Egyptian. So yeah, this can okay. phonetically represent both. Um, and in fact, because of that, like if I assume that it's just red and then I read every word that it's used in, uh, you know, let's say we have um, a word like this, where it's just these two signs, do I transcribe this head or red? Well, if I always choose this one, then I'm going to say every word that it's used in is always phonetically red, but that's circular because I've chosen mm -hmm. it. Um, so yeah, the answer is both. Okay, fair enough. I chose red in this case. So yeah, that's the, that's the one I'm most familiar with. Okay, okay. lots of things in the chat. I'm gonna look at them real quick. One multilateral morpheme. You can write error with two multiliterals. True. Yeah, we had we had a hypothesis, and then Maciej found a, a counterexample. So I was proposing that normally it's one two plus literal per per a morpheme, but a short horn cattle, according to Maciej, and yep. That's the way it is. It has two bilaterals mm -hmm. and it can be done. It can be done. Yeah, it's it's not that frequent though. Uh, I think the the rule is a trend, not an absolute, which is everything in, in Egyptian language. Uh, but I think you've observed a trend that is genuine. Uh, it's, it's quite rare for like a quadriliteral word to be written with just two biliteral signs. That's very rare, uh, but it can occasionally happen. 
Okay. Uh, Claudio, do you want to do another one? Okay. Yes. The number four is IWD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Uda. That's pretty easy. Uh, I, I gave you an example of one with, with no phonetic complement, too. It does happen. You want to do the next one? Yes. Um, that one uh, again, I, mm -hmm. I am N. Yeah. Mm, I am not sure now of N. Why are you not sure? Maybe the same, maybe similar sound. It's not the same one, but after M. But it should be different. Yeah, yeah. it's not the same letter. No. Yeah, and the phonetic complement is here. And also you have the uh, the Coptic yeah. to, to kind of hint at it, Amun and then Imen or somewhere. And then one more, because this one kind of goes with the previous one. Okay, it's the same one plus uh, R, um, R. R what? Um, ah. Yeah, the, the Ein. Yes. That's it. Um, yeah, great job. If anyone's curious, uh, the guy's name is Ray. Please stop calling him Ra. It's really annoying. Ra is the Egyptological pronunciation, right? It says Imen Ra, um, but we actually know his name was Amun Ray. We know it, so just call him Ray. Uh, but uh, it is more about the not Egyptian language. About it is the phon phon phonological structure of the Greek alphabet. <laughs> Wait, what? Because of uh, the only way, the only way. Uh, uh, pre represent of ayin, it is h, but actually it is not. Uh, sound, it is not uh, a, if sound like uh, a. Yeah, it does. It's ada. It sounds like a. It does. It's not representing the ayin. The, yeah. the ayin is lost by the time this is written. It's it's just gone. Uh, it might have gone into lengthening this vowel or, or coloring it a little bit. Uh, the the reconstruction is something like um, ruah or maybe even ria. And so it might have gone into coloring that vowel and making it more A-like, uh, which is something that ayin can do. You know, it does it in, um, in Akkadian, for example. Uh, it, it, there's like a compensatory change in the vowel with the, with the loss of the ein. Um, but the, this this grapheme does not represent the ein. It represents the this a that that particular vowel sound. So yeah, I don't know why the name Ra annoys me yeah. so much. It's just because it's like Egyptological pronunciation, and people use it all the time. And it's just like, but we know his. You know, we use Egyptological pronunciation when we don't know, right? That's that's what it's for. It's where we don't know how to pronounce something. We have this kind of like um, like stopgap solution that we use just to be able to say things out loud. Like, why are we using it in cases where we actually definitely do know what it sounded like? Let's just say it how they would have said it. I don't know. It's like a pet peeve. It's kind of pointless. Not really useful for your learning. So let's move on. Um, Mustafa, do you want to do some of these? Yeah. Okay, and uh, Randy, I'll come to you next. Uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Egyptological yacht. Mm -hmm. uh, N. Uh, double N. Are you sure? E. In N. E. 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 N. Uh, yeah. Are you sure that it needs these two ends? That's it. Uh, I don't know. Actually, not. It is uh, there. Uh, one of them uh, unnecessary because if we double and if we do double and uh, 
we need double uh, horizontal n. Yeah, we would we actually need to have written. As I remember. Yeah. We'd need to have written this to get two ends. Um, and then that's, that's a good, actually yeah. I should have put that in the part about phonetic complements. Um, if you do have two of them, there are two of them, right? They don't, it does, the, the collapsing of them together doesn't work infinitely. You can really only add one phonetic complement per sound in the biliteral. So if it's in the biliteral, you put another uniliteral n, it's still just in, but if you put two, it's now in n. You, you have genuinely have two. Um, so don't collapse them forever. But we'll see some examples that will uh, help to clarify that. Um, me continue, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Egyptological yacht. Uh, uh, hmm. Actually, um, uh, and and key k uh, in egg. but a uh, uh, middle middle sign it is a uh, biliteral it is yeah we should uh, ex express because uh, something like if we consider it inuk inok or something like similar anarchy or in Akkadian anak. Right. Um, so it is new. I actually should put it in here too, though. It is. It can also be in. Um, yeah. It can have both values. So it, it is just enek. It's this. Um, this, it, it wasn't oh, okay. an O earlier. Yeah. In, in Egyptian, it wasn't an O all the time. So it was um, probably would have been an, a stressed A vowel, so a knock earlier or a knocka, something like that. And then it became an O through a vowel oh, shift. I, I thought it is the, I thought it is the remnants of the uh, proto is uh, something like in Akkadian. Anak, Anok. It, it is that. It is that for sure. Um, like there's uh, Hebrew Anokhi, which has the same vowel shift in it, uh, and it's it's cognate with Coptic, uh, but they they happen to have undergone the same vowel shift. So this is not new, like representing some kind of like mm -hmm. U vowel in there. I think it's just Enak. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. E Egyptological yacht double. E actually, not a double. Uh, R and a Y. Yep. That's it. Uh, not much more to be said uh, about that one. Yeah. Uh, I thought uh, the first one, it is a uh, biliteral, uh, is mm -hmm. yod and uh, s, or according to Ellen, is, is z. Yeah, how did I do it? I don't even remember at this point. I should have done it. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Where's the second C? Yeah, I did as ease. Okay, well, so we'll be consistent there. So ease, and then what? Is that isut? Yeah, good. So there's there's a choice here. Um, it has the plural classifier. Uh, we haven't actually gotten to any nominal morphology yet, but the the marker of the plural is this W consonant. And in this case, uh, if we want to write it as a plural, we would write isut. So really we just have EZ here and then plural marker. So we're kind of making it plural in the transcription. I really don't like doing that. Um, I think it I think it oversimplifies how the plural would have operated phonetically in Egyptian. Um, all the evidence we have suggests that the, you know, um, the plural was not 
was not simply and adding it's also a w. feminine uh, it is also weird it is uh, it, then it seems like feminine plural and mm -hmm. it is also strange stranger because you know if the feminine plural the uh, vowel sound vowel uh, le uh, consonant uh, put in the in the middle of double consonant and it is weird because it, there is a a a1 sign in the hieroglyphic writing right uh so like the signs are kind of out of order in terms of how the transcription results. So you have like EZ and then classifiers and then the plural strokes, and then that puts a W inside the word. Um, that's not that weird for Egyptian to do that. It does sometimes do things in a sort of surprising order, um, especially with group writing, the, um, the, the presence of a, of a semi-vowel can actually represent what's happening in the previous syllable. Uh, so that's not that weird, but it it's also just, it feels like imposing our own analysis on the language itself to put that W in there to me. It's like, I've said that plurals are marked by the W and now I'm going to transcribe everything where I put in a W, whether it's actually written there or not. So it's like, I'm, I'm understanding the language according to something that I think about the language. So if I'm wrong, I'll never see the evidence that I'm wrong because I'm just imposing my, uh, my interpretation onto it. So yeah, I, I'm a big fan of just writing what's there, he's at. Um, and you, you know that it's a plural because it's got the plural strokes. Oh, thank you. Um, Aaron, question. Yeah, the single stroke that's right in front of the man determinative, what is that serving? I think it's probably that, uh, I'm not sure what the hieratic for this sign would be, but let's just do something like that. Um, it would have been formatted something like this. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's kind of filler. And also in, in the, I don't know, it's kind of a singular and a plural at the same time. So, because uh -huh. it's like a collective. It's like EZ is, is crew, uh, but it's made of multiple people. So, um, you know, you have this problem in English too. Do you say the crew is uh, rowing the boat or the crew are rowing the boat? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I, I think that's probably why, but I don't know for sure. It's a good question. Okay. Uh, and Randy, do you want to do a few of these? Uh, sure. So we have uh, I. Uh, second uh, T, uh, Aleph, and a uh, double I. Yeah. Chai. And uh, is that related? And then in Coptic would be a Joe. Is that related mm -hmm. to uh, a Coptic uh, G well, like the steel? Because I noticed that it has the same two determinatives yep. at the end the finger, and the finger would be above the, the hand holding the pain or whatever it is yeah the, the finger uh the finger classifier normally has to do with things that are have something to do with like skill or craft or like dexterity so a thief you know has nimble fingers and then the the hand holding the stick is like a forceful action um yeah and it's related to the the g which is like theft um and also just g to take yeah. So yeah, it's a, a taker. All right, and then we have, uh, I think it's, uh, I always mix this one up. Uh, Ein Aleph? Yep. Or is it the other way around? Um, it's the way you just said. I'll tell you that it took me a long time to consistently get it right. Hmm. Um, yeah. It's It's this way. Uh, it, eventually, you'll just remember that it's that way after you see it enough times. Um, and then the Coptic. So, Randy, what do you think? Why are there three? Why do I have three Coptics here? So, the first one, O, is uh, masculine. Mm -hmm. The second one is uh, O, feminine. And the 
third one, I don't know if I've, I mean, it's definitely, it's just by coincidence, there's an I or an E, a uh, plural in masculine plural in Greek, but for Coptic, I don't know what the I-E is. Is that also a plural? It's also plural. Yeah, it is a, it is a coincidence that it's in Greek. It's the, um, so this, this is an adjective meaning great, and it would often go in compounds. So you would say like, um, like Ramau is uh, like, it's actually like rich in, in, or wealthy specifically in Coptic, but it, it originally just meant great man. Um, and then if you had a, I don't know if there's Remo, I guess you could have that. Should have chosen an example where the feminine is more obvious. Um, But yeah, the, so the different pronunciations are just whether the adjective is masculine, singular, feminine, singular, or plural. And that survives into Coptic by like changing this vowel that appears at the end of compounds that used to have this adjective in them. Okay. If that makes sense. Uh, time for one more? Sure. Okay. Uh, ein, M, Aleph. M. Yeah. Is is one of those M's uh, 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 redundant or? Yeah. It definitely is. Um, maybe let's just do it like this. I guess it's the they're out of order though. It's it's weird. I don't really I don't really understand this one, honestly. Like I don't know why it has them in this order. Um. I don't know exactly how to transcribe it. Like on on some level, I want to be really faithful what's written in the hieroglyph so i'll probably transcribe it this way amam uh, but then the coptic we know for sure is ima which is a single m so and nothing you know definitely nothing in between um like if there had been something in between if there had been two m's they could collapse into a single m in coptic but if there was something in between they couldn't so there's just no way you can get this from this there's just no obvious way to do that, but this is what's written in the hieroglyphs. So yeah, that's just, just what we'll go with. That will just have to be kind of a bit of a mystery. I think okay. we have time for one more. Uh, sure. Um, is that, uh, this one I mixed up too. Is it W Olive or is it all W? Or no, W, w Olive. Olive. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, Shaw, like a uh, fricative H. All right. Of S and then all of, and then mm -hmm. the other two would be determinatives or classifiers. Right. Yep. Uh, yeah, and we, you can use, for the sake of this class, we can use determinative or classifier more or less interchangeably. There is a debate to be had there, but um, not really relevant to what we're doing right now. Yeah, I don't know what the Coptic would be, uh, but Egyptological pronunciation, something like washa. This, interestingly, is where. Uh, Coptic shy comes from, from the demotic version of that. Oh. You can see the three little like flower bits at the top. That's kind of yeah. neat. Okay, so uh, you guys did really well. Obviously, this is making sense to you. Um, the phonetic complements, I've seen students struggle with that in the past, especially with the whole like do I add another letter or does it collapse? And how do I know when it does and when it doesn't? Um, it can be a little iffy at times, but you know, it's pretty reliable and everybody seemed to handle that just fine. So um, minor announcement, uh, we'll have class next week at, the, at this usual time. Let me see what date that is, October 16th. Uh, two weeks from now, we won't have class because I have to go out of town. Uh, but next week, I'll, I'll see you guys at the same time. So until then, uh, have a great week. Come to office hours if you want to. And, so are um, tomorrow office hours? They there are. are. Office hours tomorrow. There are. Yeah. Um, at, uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, remind me your time zone, Aaron. Uh, Pacific. So I think that's not. It's the same as when uh, reading class was today, right? It is. Yeah. 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 Okay. It'll be in the morning. Okay. Thank you. Great. Everyone have a great week. I'll see you soon.